Well, good morning. Glad you are here. The fallback remnant that are still here. Pumpkin spice deniers is what I call you. Elect of the Lord. Here we are. All right, so if you have a Bible with you, we are in the book of Matthew. Why don't you grab that? We are in chapter 19, Matthew 19, verses 16 and following. Matthew 19, 16 and following. Uh, this is the story of the rich young ruler. Uh, if you look at the screen and say, uh, you misspelled ruler, uh, that's because Matthew doesn't call him the rich young ruler. In fact, neither does Mark. The only place that the person is called a ruler is in Luke. But it's become such a famous Christian story that there are some of the things we're gonna need to peel back a little bit before we dive into uh, the passage. So uh, when they have this conversation and this man approaches him, in verse 16, Matthew 19, 16 says, and behold, a man came up to him saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? All right, little, little background trivia for you here. Uh, if you're ever reading your Bible and you wonder why it says stuff like, and behold, uh, this is a remnant of the storytelling aspect of people spreading uh, the news of who Jesus was. In the ancient culture, a lot of the Greek gospels are written in present tense because they would tell the story like, and he is here doing this, and he, and look, there's a guy, right? Come, you know, he just came into the crowd. So they would talk that way, and so some of it bleeds over when you see behold and all these kind of things. The readers are, are reading this in present tense like a, they're watching a movie, like it's just happening. So some of that's a remnant from that. But you move into the text, it says, behold, uh, the word man here just is the word one. One comes up to him. Uh, it's later on in the text that we find out that this is a young man. They don't use the word for an adult male. It's a young man. Uh, uh, Jews, uh, as you know, the males, the females become adults at 12. Then they have this season from 12 to 40 where they are men and women, but they aren't really men and women. They have to hit 40 to be a man or woman. Uh, you'll see people talk to Jesus this way. Uh, when Jesus is teaching, they'll go, you're not even 40. What are you, you're, yeah, bah, 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 bah. you're a teenager, right? Uh, so if you think we have extended adolescence, you weren't even a man until you're 40 in ancient Israel. Uh, and he comes up to him and he says, teacher, uh, rabbi, right? Rabbi, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? What good deed must I do to have eternal life? Now, the first thing about this passage in the story of the rich young ruler, which most people who've been to church uh, their, their whole lives know, if you're new to the Bible and you're new to Fellowship Church, it's totally fine if you don't know what we're talking about, you'll hear the story this morning. The first thing we need to talk about, because it's an old assumption, is that this is a story about money. Uh, this is not a story about money. Money is the tangent of the conversation that is going to go on in this passage. Are there things from this story that we can talk about uh, in tangent with money? Yes, there are. There are some tangents we can talk about when it comes to money. But uh, this is a story, this is an altercation about salvation, right? What good deed must I do to have eternal life? This is the focus of the conversation that Jesus and this young man are gonna have. It's what the whole conversation is about. Uh, they are going to intersect in money, but that is not the primary place they are talking about. Uh, and in order to understand the man's question, we need to understand ancient Israel just a little bit. So Egypt uh, has slaves, they are the Hebrews, you know. Uh, God calls Abraham, Abraham wanders, Abraham has Isaac, Isaac, Isaac wanders, then they have uh, Jacob who becomes Israel, then they go to Egypt during famine, there's gonna be famine and they go to Egypt, eventually they become slaves, God delivers them through Moses, 10 commandments, uh, you've seen the movie, you've seen Yul Brynner, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and then they finally leave and they go out into the desert and they receive the law of God. And God says to them, if you will be my people, if you will be a people of my possession, if you will follow the commandments that I am going to give you, I will be your God and you will be my people. 
and it's a contract almost. Now we find out in the New Testament, it wasn't as much a contract as you think it is, but to them, this is a contract. If you follow me, I will be your God, you will be my people. If you follow me, I will bless you among the nations. If you don't, I will curse you among the nations. And this is exactly what plays out over the course of Israel's history. When they would follow God, they would be blessed. When they would not follow God, they would be cursed. Like the book of Judges is literally this. And then Israel followed God and they were blessed and everything went great. And then the leader died and another leader came and then they didn't follow God. And they didn't follow God at all, and then God cursed them with snakes or weather or armies or locusts or sores on their body. And then they came back. This is, it's also the book of Chronicles, Kings. Like if you're reading the Old Testament, you're going, this feels a little cyclical. That's because it is. It just constantly comes back and forth. Now, what is good for Israel in the national is also good for the Jew personally. So that by the time that Jesus comes along, it is a known fact, it is a known fact that if you are rich, it is because you are godly. This is is how they interpret the world. Someone who is rich is a godly person who has obeyed God and been blessed because of it. Now, uh, I'm gonna take you back into Deuteronomy real quick so you can read some of the passage of scripture that we're talking about. This is Deuteronomy 28. Uh, And all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will make you abound in prosperity in the fruit of your womb and in the fruit of your livestock and in the fruit of your ground within the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasury, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless the work of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. So it's this picture of, if you obey me, I am going to make you rich. And if you are rich, it is an indication that you have been obedient to God that you are a good, godly person, okay? So, what do we know about Jesus? When we say that Jesus hung out with the poor and the sinners, that's not two categories, right? That is not two different categories. It's the same category. It's also not totally true, right? Fastball right down the middle already. You're like, I need a pumpkin spice latte. You never need that, okay? Uh, But let's start on the original point. To Israel, the poor and the sinner is the same thing. It is the same thing. So when Jesus is hanging out with these poor people, uh, God is saying, uh, the Israel's going, he's hanging out with sinners. They probably didn't even mention poor because we knew they're poor. It also, if you had physical defects, if you were sick, it's because you sinned. So all these people are coming to Jesus to be healed and they're going, they're just bringing in more sinners. Uh, the famous song about grace, I once was blind and now I see. Uh, we know it, our most famous Christian song. At the start of the story of the blind man in John 9, the disciples themselves asked Jesus, who sinned, him or his parents, that he would be born blind? Think about that sentence for a minute. Did he sin in the womb and thus become blind? Yes, he was listening to hard rock music and he sinned in the womb, right? Uh, So when you see a rich young ruler, right, in Luke, just a rich young man coming up to Jesus, this is laden with presuppositions already, already. Why did the disciples, the previous story, keep the children from coming to Jesus? You remember last week's story? 
They, Jesus, they, they, the disciples kept the children from coming to Jesus. No, 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 you're not allowed to come to Jesus. Why did they let a rich young man come to Jesus? Presuppositions. Well, he's, he's godly. He needs to be around Jesus. Uh, it's not true that Jesus just hang up with uh, the poor and the outcast. That is, that, is not fault. that is not true. We see Jesus with rich and powerful people all through the scriptures just as much. It's just the opposite mistake that people are trying to make now with the Bible. Uh, Jesus kind of hung out with everybody. Zacchaeus, uh, Roman centurions, Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, on and on and on and on. But when this guy comes up, and we already know this is a salvation passage, a rich young man coming up to Jesus and going, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Is to the crowd not a challenge, but a, whoa, this guy who's already so godly wants to know what else he can do for God. Do you see? When he comes up, they're going, one of the godly people just came up to Jesus and goes, I'm not sure I'm doing enough. What else do I need to do? Okay, so, and Jesus answers him and says, why do you ask me about what is good? Dun, dun, dun. Who else am I supposed to ask? I've always thought this funny, this, this part of the story is funny because in other, other gospels, it says, good teacher. And he goes, why do you call me good? No one is good but God above. You are God. Like, don't confuse this, Jesus. Come on, man. Uh, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. First fast ball. Uh, the guy who comes up and the whole crowd that is listening assumes he is good. He assumes he's good. The crowd assumes he's good. So when Jesus goes, why do you ask me questions about what is good? There is only one who is good. Now, no one there would dispute that. No one there would dispute that. Uh, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, which ones? Which ones? Uh, all, all the commandments? Uh, yeah, uh, keep all the commandments. Uh, and Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you, share not, you shall not bear false witness lie, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Every one of these comes from the 10 commandments except one, and that is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now get ready for a little trick. If you look at these commandments and you see them, uh, murder, adultery, steal, lying, false witness, honoring your father and mother. He lists every one of the commandments besides envy because the guy is the envy of everybody there. And he also doesn't list any commandment about God. You shall keep the Lord your God, he holy. You shall make no uh, idols. You shall not lose the Lord's name in vain. And he ends with what Jesus says is the second greatest commandment of all of them, love your neighbor as yourself. He goes straight at this dude and his attitudes toward the people around him. Straight at him and his attitude of the people around him. How are you treating other people? That's all I'll ask you. I won't ask you about what do you think about God. I won't ask you about are you keeping everything holy. I'll just ask you one question. What are you doing for the people around you? Where are you on this one? So uh, he should automatically be a little worried, right? I don't want Jesus asking me any questions about how my heart is. How's your heart, Greg? Mm-mm, mm-mm. We're gonna sing some more. I'm not talking. And the young man said, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? What do I still lack? Uh, there is a whole lot of philosophy in these two sentences that I need to point out to you. Uh, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven 
and come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. All right, let's talk about this word perfect. Uh, This lack and perfect go together, right? We need to see this. To be perfect, you have to be everything. You have to be totally perfect, complete. (coughs) In fact, in both Hebrew thought and Greek thought, because they had been all kind of jumbled up by this point, what we think of perfect is outstanding in every sense, right? We think of perfect is not just complete, but outstanding in every sense. Something could be very good and complete, but we wouldn't call that perfect. We would say that's very good. Only if something is absolutely at the top of every single category would we say perfect, but that's not how Jews and Greek think about perfect. To Jews and Greeks, perfect means complete. It lacks nothing, okay? That's the idea of perfection that Jesus and the people of of the time of the Bible thought of. It lacks nothing. Uh, In fact, the word for perfect becomes a philosophical school Uh, that influences much of our thought. And the idea is telos, right? Teleological understanding of the world. What are you supposed to be? And once you find out what you're supposed to be and you are what you're supposed to be, you are perfect. Even if you're not outstanding in our sense of evaluation, you are fully what you're supposed to be, so you're perfect. That's why the Bible calls us perfect in Jesus. Are we all outstanding in everything? I cannot do math at all. If I build a bridge, don't drive over it. Don't. There's a lot of things I am not outstanding at. Am I perfect in Jesus? Yes. Why? Because I am complete. Do you see? I am everything that God created me to be and he has made me perfect through Jesus. I have everything I'm supposed to be, everything out there. So when this guy says, what do I lack? He's saying, I need to be completed. I know I'm not completed. Something in me is telling me I'm not completed. Everything you guys think is that I'm godly and everything, but something in me knows I'm lacking something. What do I need to be complete? And Jesus says, you need to give away half your stuff. And the guy can't do it. Now, we wanna see greed here. And that's probably true, but it's also probably true about station. Because if you give away half your stuff, you're not just saying, uh, I don't need to be, I'm too greedy to give away my stuff. It's saying, let me show you that I'm not as righteous as everyone thinks I am. I'm giving away my righteousness in the eyes of my community if I give away everything. Do you see? The social pressure, the social standing of being considered godly is as much at play here as anything else. There are places in the Bible where Jesus says things, Sermon on the Mount uh, being an example where he says, the love of money is the root of great evil. You don't need to come to this passage in order to talk about the New Testament's idea of money. The love of money is is the root of great evil is actually what it says. We say money is the root of all evil. That's not what it says. The love of money is a root of great evil. But this is not just about money. This is about our understanding of where we are with God. And if God comes to you and you say, what do I need to be absolutely sure that I am going to be in your kingdom? And he answers, this is what you lack. You're not perfect. 
You will only be perfect if you do this. In the gospel's eyes, and if you're here this morning, you don't know what the Bible actually teaches about salvation. It says you must be perfect. Perfect, complete is the only way you will go to heaven. And there's no way for us ever to be complete without Jesus. That's what the gospel actually is. He went away sad and Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Another line that we love to use about money when it's actually about salvation. And I'm gonna show you why. This is, again, tangential to what the Bible talks about with money. It can be a God to you, and if it is a God to you, then you will not go to the actual God's heaven. Uh, But not what it's about. A little preacher note here, for as long as I've been alive, people to get up, well, you know, actually, there was a gate into Jerusalem called the eye of the needle, and the camel couldn't walk through it. So that's what Jesus was talking about. Not true. Preach is great. Great story. Not true. Sorry. I know you love your your pastor from home, but no. Uh, Now pay attention to this. I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? Who then can be saved. They're not going, well, I better get rid of my lotto tickets then. They're not talking about, well, what about us? They're saying, if if he can't be saved, if the people that we know are the godliest people can't be saved, who can be saved? Who can actually be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And there's the gospel. You cannot be perfect. You know it, I know it. We think God's test is can I be good or better than the average? God's test is perfection. And that is impossible. With us, it is impossible. With God, anything is possible. I wanna show you the Apostle Paul giving this exact same lesson just in the, in the Pauline epistles where the Holy Spirit has taught him, this isn't just about money, it's really about your heart. The rich young man's money has nothing to do with this story. It has everything to do with his heart everything to do with his heart and not wanting to give up not just his fortune, but his standing as a good moral person in the culture. This is from Philippians. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who will mutilate the flesh. That's the verse that's gonna be on my tombstone. Remember when you can write the Bible and call people dogs in it? It's fantastic. No, this is a debate over the religious observance of circumcision. I'm not gonna go into detail. Uh, When Christianity first started, groups of Jews were going around going, yes, you need Jesus, but you also have to follow the law. If you don't follow the law, you can't get into heaven. You're not righteous enough if you're not religiously perfect. If you don't do all the right ceremonies, you won't go to heaven. Paul calls those people dogs, evildoers, mutilators of the flesh. For we are the circumcision, he says, who worship by the spirit of God and glory in Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. He's saying, no, it has to do with your heart and your spirit and your belief, not with your external morality. He says, although I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has reasons for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, 
as to the law, a Pharisee, the strictest sect, as to zeal, persecutor of the church, loved, loved Judaism so much he decided to kill everybody who was against it. Uh, as to righteousness under the law, he doesn't say perfect. He says blameless because the law should have taught him that he wasn't perfect, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends on faith. You might as well see the word righteousness as perfection the perfection from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain life, resurrection from the dead. Same question, how do I inherit eternal life? You count everything rubbish that you thought justified you and you cling only to Christ. Who then can be saved? The one who puts their faith in Christ and only the one who puts their faith in Christ. You cannot show up to God's house on the day of judgment and go, look at all my worthless things. Don't they save me? Look at my good standing. And let me tell you right now, because we all see it coming like a freight train. The time is coming very soon when to say you are a Bible-believing, Jesus-following Christian in this culture is gonna cost you vastly. Vastly. And to have good standing in the community, you're gonna have to say, oh, well, I don't believe old superstitions. These days will be, I stand on Christ and Christ alone because there is nothing else. There is nothing else. Now, Peter, uh, Peter. (laughs) Peter hears the lesson and he says, then Peter said in reply, see, we have left everything and followed you. Yeah, you had two fishing poles and a boat, Peter. (laughs) You had a hut, two fishing poles, and half a bag of minnows. Like, behold us, people. We have left everything and followed him. What then will we have, right? Now, you expect Jesus to go, (sighs) again, like, it's like, let's build a tent on the mountain with the dudes. Quiet. I've got to go to Jerusalem and be killed. That'll never happen to you, Lord. Would you just learn to be quiet, right? But Jesus doesn't answer him that way. Jesus doesn't answer him that way. He actually, because most time, you know, Jesus is going to bring the hammer. He actually flips the script and he says, oh, let me show you what's going to happen to you. And this is what he says. Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Jesus doesn't turn around and drop the bomb. He goes, oh, what are you gonna get? Well, you're gonna judge all of Israel. You're gonna sit on the throne beside me, and you're gonna be rich beyond all imagination because you won't care about it. You'll only see it as a way to bless. 
you'll only see as a way to expand my glory. Uh, in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, do you know what it says to the people that will follow the Christ? He says, little g, because you will be gods, little g. Now that's almost blasphemy. But when God makes someone perfect, he doesn't just make them perfect, he makes them complete. The blessing of those who will say, I have no standing but you, Jesus, and I see it. I see I am not the righteous among the land. I am not the one who is moral while everybody else is falling into despair. I am not the Christian who can look at the culture and say, look at all these wicked evildoers, but instead say, there, but by the grace of God, go I. And who, like their Lord, will count it a blessing to be counted among the mocked. Because we have nothing but him. He is the solid rock. All other ground, amen. Let's pray together. Our Father and God, we thank you for your gospel of truth, your gospel of salvation, your gospel that gives us perfection as a gift, not as a wage. Let us turn away from any earthly thing that would draw our eyes. Let the things of earth become strangely dim. And that includes our own righteousness, not a righteousness of my own but a righteousness that depends on faith in Jesus Christ. I believe you, Lord. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the gospel. And in everything, Lord, praise your glorious name. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.